All right, so welcome to those of you at MoChurch.tv. Welcome to those of you in the room. We got Mo Kids back, baby. This is so exciting, man. There's kids downstairs. I hope, I hope we hear them distract us in our service. Like, I miss the days of hearing kids like shouting stuff in the basement and, you know, it'll be a little bit more muffled. They'll be like, where's the Lord, you know, because they got masks on and all that. But man, I can't wait to hear kids bumping downstairs and making noise and being loud and hopefully interrupting stuff that I'm saying. So, so turn to John chapter 19, download the free Bible app, um, whatever you got to do to get there. Uh, feel free, I've been saying through this series, to sketch your own version of the piece of art that we'll get to. And just to interact with it in that way, to see things and think about things, ponder things that maybe you wouldn't have seen if you weren't sketching it. I don't mind you at all multitasking, looking down, sketching the whole time. You won't get yelled at here, at least for that. Um, for being boring, you might get yelled at, but not for that. Uh, so, you know, feel free to do that during the sermon. So, uh, this week, some weeks when I'm preaching, I, I struggle to come up with an intro that best sets up the topic. And I'm like, man, I can't think of anything. It really sets up with a good image that I want to use for this topic. And, uh, and that's not really the case this week. Uh, I just felt like it was appropriate to kind of introduce the painting and jump right into the scripture. So really, that's what we're doing this week because it kind of sets up the scene in the painting. And so real quick, this painting is on display in the gallery, in a gallery of art in Milan, Italy. And it was painted somewhere around 1480. Uh, there's a lot of debate, about 20 years of debate of where exactly it was painted in time. But about 1480, it was uh, painted by an artist named Andrea Mantegna. And uh, he was an Italian Renaissance painter. So this week, we're going to jump right into the scripture to get us to the scene that he envisions for us. So John 19 says this. Jesus is on the cross in the scene, and it says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, now that's John who wrote this gospel, one of the 12 disciples, that's his way to refer to himself in the late part of the gospel. He keeps referring to himself as the one or the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is pretty cool. And it says, so there was Jesus' mother and next to him was John standing nearby. Jesus said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, John, who's writing this, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. So this is kind of cool. Jesus, in anguish and agony on the cross, looks down. He sees the only one of the 12 disciples who's at the crucifixion. The rest of them fled like roaches when lights turned on in a kitchen. I mean, just, I mean, in some of the places I've lived anyways. And so just they fled. John's the only one there. And he looks down. He sees his mother, Mary. He sees John. He says, Okay, from now on, he's your son. From now on, you take care of her like your mother. So he's, he's caring for his mother from the cross in anguish. And it says then, as we covered last week in verse 30, that soon after that, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So just a little while after that happened, this is what happens next. And this is how we get to the scene that Montaigne depicts for us. It says this, verse 38. It says, later, Joseph of Arimathea. Now, if you're like, who's that? You're with most everybody. He's, he's kind of a minor, minor character that's mostly focused in on during this scene. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate, the Roman governor, for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier in John chapter 3 had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So this is how we get to the scene that is depicted by Montaigne. Um, here we are. Now, man, this is really a tough like, portrait to swallow, isn't it? It is a really tough painting 
to take in. It is so stark. I mean, there's just, there's so many words you could use to describe them, but stark is, I mean, it's like kind of in your face, but it's Montaigne's vision of the scene with Jesus' dead body laying in the tomb and three people who loved him deeply lamenting his death and, and being there after his horrific crucifixion. And you've noticed that um, as we'll go through these three mourners, these are all people who were at the crucifixion. They saw the crucifixion and followed Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus back to the tomb for Jesus' burial. So let's take a look. There's three mourners. We're going to zoom in on them. And the three mourners off to the side are first, this is the apostle John. Okay, this is the author of the gospel, the one of the 12 that was actually at the crucifixion. And we see him there and he's, he's wringing his hands, you can see down here. You might also say he's also praying, but he's, he's wringing his hands, he's grieving, he's mourning, he's probably in disbelief, like the surreal feeling after you've lost someone very close to you, like I can't believe he's gone. And, and so he's there wringing his hands, praying, and he's weeping. You can see a tear under his eye and his mouth gaping wide open in disbelief. The second person, the most prominent of the mourners, is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And this is really strange because Montaigne chooses to depict her looking much older than we typically see Mary in the crucifixion scene or around the passion or suffering of Jesus. No one depicts her looking this old in the pictures. And so he's trying to communicate something by doing that. And it might just be the way it ages you when someone that you lose who's so dear to you is gone. I mean, even though it's just happened, this might be his way of just, you know, kind of showing that with, with Mary. And so she has tears streaming down her eyes. She's patting one of her eyes with a, with a cloth. And then there's a third person. You can barely see this third person, right? You just see kind of a mouth and a chin over here. And people debate. The, the, the number one opinion is that that's Mary Magdalene, one of the female disciples of Jesus. Um, or it could be Mary, uh, the, the wife of Clopas, who also was at the crucifixion. So either way, you have three mourners who are in the tomb, who are at the crucifixion, who came back to the tomb to see Jesus buried there. Now, the painting is called Lamenting of Christ. And a lamentation is really, it's an expression of grief. That's what it means to lament. It means to grieve. And so... But as you've, as you've heard, I mean, that's kind of the polite name for the painting. As you saw in the video we just showed, it started with also a very stark title. And that is the title that this painting is also known as. And that is very simply, The Dead Christ. And you're like, wow, drinking in even just that title. It's so like shocking. It rattles you a little bit. It almost feels sacrilegious or disrespectful to say the dead Christ. I mean, Christ is clearly the center focus of this painting. And in this painting, Montaigne uses something that's a technique. I mean, he uses some different techniques in general. He uses distortion. Um, people talk about how if you study the body parts, some of the body parts just don't seem the right size compared to other body parts. Like, you know, experts agree his feet are way too small for the dimensions. And, you know, there's different parts of his body, like his upper legs are way too short compared to the lower legs. And there's just all this distortion he uses. And a lot of people are like, I don't like it. It, it feels grotesque. He looks like a dead dwarf on a, a marble slab, people have said. And I, I really do like it. It doesn't distract me. But the other thing he uses is something that's called foreshortening. And, and, and foreshortening is a, an artistic technique where basically you're using a 2D canvas to express three-dimensional length, like to kind of show this is projected or extended. Really looking at it, you've got a body that is painted at this length, but he's trying to give the impact of this foreshortening effect that the, the body extends and it creates a 3D feeling of depth. And that's what foreshortening is. And so it's this dramatic technique that plays tricks on your eyes to feel like you're in a 3D environment. But some people feel, again, like, man, it's kind of freakish. Um, and, and to add to the effect, the, the museum in Italy, where it is hung, is it, the, Christ's head is put at about the same level that the regular height observer, whatever that would be, would be who'd walk up and look at it. You're almost face-to-face -face with Christ with this painting. 
And so that kind of adds to the effect of the foreshortening and it leading back to Christ's head and the small feet helping you draw your eyes up to seeing actually the face of Christ. And they hang it in a place where his face is kind of eye to eye with you. Now, I know a guy who is a, a kind of a world-renowned Christian theologian actually now. He's an author and a blogger. His name's Michael Frost. Brilliant dude. And two years ago, he blogged about the fact that he was going to spend 40 days during Lent, leading up to Easter, with, as he would call it, the dead Christ. And he spent 40 days kind of prayerfully meditating on this leading up to Easter. And he wrote in his blog two years ago, he said, it's an Easter composition unlike any other. He said, in Montaigne's vision, Christ is dead. He's like a stone. The muted color palettes, all pinks, grays, dusty blues, reinforces the fogginess of death. Jesus lies stock still, cold, lifeless, and defeated in this painting. And in preparation for that Easter, he blogged this. He said, I'm going to spend 40 days sitting with the dead Christ. When you hear that I'm going to be contemplating this picture as a Lenten exercise, you might be asking yourself, is he going to stare at a picture of dead Jesus for a month? Like he's anticipating that. He says, but there's so much in Montaigne's vision, a daring viewpoint that deserves reflection, he says. For a depiction of death is full of meaning and beauty. Now, the painting has all these dull and eerie uh, tones of color and light, but you have to think about that. It's because not only are we dealing with death here, we're in a tomb at twilight. I mean, you almost can't picture a creepier time to be in a tomb, to be looking at dead Jesus, his body. And it's at twilight. It's these people who followed him from the crucifixion to watch him buried in this new tomb. And to me, the whole vibe feels like, and, and this will bring up some images for people, it does for me, you're in a hospital room with someone you love who has just passed away. I mean, that's what this feels like to me, is being crowded in that room where someone you love deal, dearly and you can't even believe it's happened, it's over, it's surreal. I can't believe this moment is real, but you're kind of cramped in there. It's almost claustrophobic as everyone gathers around to mourn over this person that you've lost. It's, 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 it's strange. And Michael Frost says, the image is so tightly cropped that it feels as if we're squeezed into a cell with the lifeless Christ and his mourners. It's cramped, the space is pent, confined, ghastly. A jar filled with ointment, or perfume sits on the corner of the slab, no doubt to keep the stench of death at bay. The more you look at it, the more it draws you into the slightly ghoulish sensation of being entombed with Jesus. Man, this is such a striking, strange painting, but man, I think one that's worthy of our attention as we lead up to Easter. You know, for me, the number one thing that for me draws my eyes in the painting, I know that the foreshortening is, is meant to draw you to the face of Jesus, but there's no doubt in my mind that Montaigne also is trying to highlight other stuff in this painting because the number one thing that my eyes are drawn to are the wounded feet of Christ. Like when I look at this painting, I immediately go to the feet because they're shocking. Like to look at his feet like this, all the wounds on his hands and his feet are, are dry and still open. And, and one person says the wounds display almost clinical accuracy. Like the, the, another person says the skin around the wounds looks like it is dried and may even be sharp. And so there's so much realism in the scene. And Michael Frost, one more time, he writes this. He says, it's hard to imagine another depiction of Christ that so emphasizes the soles of his feet. Montaigne paints them more clearly than even Jesus' face, as if the wounded feet of Christ must be seen by us. Michael Frost says, look at them. These are the feet upon which he trampled all over Jerusalem. The, the, the feet that were anointed by a woman at the home of Simon the Pharisee, the feet that he wouldn't allow Simon Peter, his disciple, to wash, preferring instead to wash his disciples' feet at their last meal together. The path of Christ's feet followed, the, the path that Christ's feet followed have brought him here to death. So this painting, it's it is harsh, it's crude, it's grim, it's disturbing, it's it's crass, it's coarse, it's 
barbaric. It's, I mean, you go, go on and on. Last night, my wife looked at me from across the living room, and she, she's like, this painting is haunting. I was like, I know. It's so worthy of our attention, attention because it is haunting. Again, the painting is called The Dead Christ. He's in the tomb. He's on a marble slab. And there's something really interesting to me that at the time of Montaigne's death, he still had the painting in his possession. It was never delivered to a buyer. And art historians argue over or debate over, theorize why this was. Some say maybe he painted it for himself. You'll look up on places like Wikipedia and there are different people who just say, yeah, he painted it for his personal funeral chapel. Other art historians say maybe he painted it and he loved it so much that he kept it. And then there's others who say, but some historians have speculated that maybe he painted it and tried to sell it, but it was rejected by patrons because it's such an extreme focus on the dead body of Jesus. We're used to seeing it maybe sometimes dead on the cross or being taken down from the cross, but this is just too much reality. Like to see the wounds of Christ as they are and to see his body in the tomb, people more, I mean, look at his feet. That is so blunt that maybe patrons are like, uh, no, thank you. That's just grim. That's just depressing. That's just, that's just too much. And, and it makes me, when I look at the feet, just kind of say, man, it reminds me that everything Jesus said through his ministry kept coming up with this theme of, hey, follow me. Like, walk where I walk, do what I do, follow me. Uh, follow me. Uh, I can't. I've got, got a lot of money, okay? Follow me. I can't. My, my dad's not doing well. I want to make sure I'm going to wait till my dad is gone and I get to bury him. Then I might come follow you. Follow me. Okay, I'll drop everything. I'll drop my fisherman nets. Okay, everywhere he went, he was telling people, follow me. Come where I'm going. Walk where I walk. Do what I do. Imitate me. Be my apprentice, my disciple, my student in the faith. And everywhere he walked, these feet walked. And where they went, he blessed children. He went and he fed hungry people. He went and he embraced the outcasts. He went and he sought out people who were spiritually lost and confused, who weren't among the religious people, and he sought them out. The people that others thought were riffraff and the irreligious, the people you should stay away from if you're a good kid, that kind of stuff, like stay away from them. And he went there. That's where his feet went. And eventually he took up his cross and he said, follow me. He died to himself as a sacrifice. He said, follow me. And he's basically saying, lay down your life for others. Follow me, serve people the way I do, and lay down your life for others. I mean, look at his feet. Those are the feet of the man who said, follow me. Give your life up for other people. Walk where I will walk. And an image that we use at Momentum a whole lot, is I just think it's an incredible image that I want us to wrestle with constantly, is Romans chapter 6, where a Christian named Paul says this. And it hits home with this painting, I think. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, so if you, because of faith in Jesus, because you decided you believe Jesus is who he says he is, has done what he says he's done, if you put faith in Jesus and were baptized into Christ, he's talking to you and to me. You who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him. We're in the tomb with him in this scene through baptism into death in order that just as Christ is raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new, regenerated, resurrected life. Now, when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, if by faith, put your faith in Christ said, I'm going to follow you. You're my Lord. You're my leader. I'll follow you. And you've been baptized. What he's saying is, this represents the whole gospel account of death, burial, resurrection. He's like, that, that's the whole picture of what being immersed in water is. It's burial. The water is a tomb that's under here. That's what that is. And, and the idea I always say is like, man, when you are baptized, eyes are closed, arms are crossed, breathing stops. Because that is a metaphor of us dying to follow those wounded feet of Christ and to say, I will die as Christ called me to die because I'm following him. And, and scripturally, it kind of teaches that if you're a Christian, there was an old you. There was an old man of sin. I seriously used to think all the time, 
picture this old man of sin, this decrepit person that died, you know, when I was baptized. Like, oh no, it took me years to realize, like, oh no, it just means the previous person. It means the previous me, like the old self. When I put faith in Jesus, this old self is buried and dead, and I rise to walk in a new life. This old self is put behind me. One biblical scholar puts it this way. I love this. He said, this doesn't mean that something within us died, such as sin itself or the seed of sin or the power of sin. No, we ourselves died. The person that we used to be, the one who is dominated by sin and the flesh, the old man died, your previous self. He said, something happened to us that was so radical that it can only be, be described by an act of dying. It can only be called an act of dying. It was an act of saving grace performed upon us by the power of God. And man, this painting brings that to light for me, is that when Jesus died, he had been calling us the whole time to follow him. Now, here's where that leads us today in the 21st century, is there are many, many great churches around the world. There are many great churches in Ohio, in Northeast Ohio, and, and any great church offers a whole bunch of great stuff for us. Like God's church, established by Jesus, offers a bunch of great stuff to us. I mean, it offers things like, dude, you meet some pretty awesome people, okay? There's some jerks in the church, too. I know that. I've been around the church a whole bunch. There's a church around here. But there's a whole lot of awesome people that you could be friends with and learn from and look up to and be like, man, I want to be a, a mom like she's a mom, or I want to be a, you know, a friend like he's a friend, or whatever, I mean, church offers great stuff for your kids to do and to learn and stories to kind of embrace and to say, I want to emulate that story of Joseph in the Bible or whoever. You know, there's great live music that you can worship to and there's helpful practical teaching about love and dating and marriage and how to deal with bitterness and how to grow in your relationship with God. But really the truth is a vital part of Momentum's goal of helping people win is helping people die. Like really, when you think about it, we're trying to lead people spiritually and help people win spiritually, ultimately that means we're trying to help people die because Jesus only offers life and victory to those who will die to themselves. I mean, that's, that's what this is about. It's an invitation from Jesus, from Momentum, from me, from your Mo Group leader to come and to die. It's as stark as that painting is, man. It's, it's, it's just, it's in your face. Jesus' invitation, the thing that he offers isn't, hey, come to student ministry and you get free pizza. It's come to student ministry. There might be some pizza now and then. We might play some games, but what we're going to teach you about is following Jesus, come and die to self. Jesus said, follow me with these wounded feet. Follow me where I'm going. In fact, one time in another gospel, Luke chapter 9, Jesus puts it this way from his own mouth. He says this in Luke chapter 9. He says, the son of man, he says, the son of man must suffer many things. The son of man is what he calls himself, refers to himself. It's about the most humble title he can possibly give to himself. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the religious leaders, the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. But then listen how he follows that up. He says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my follower, my disciple, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. So Jesus is like, yeah, there is this initial surrender that happens. I die to self, the old man's dead, come back to life or whatever. But there's the very much the reality of as you grow spiritually in Christ, it is a daily decision to say, today, I follow Jesus. I submit to Jesus. Sometimes it's the day after we screwed up. Sometimes it's the day after we blew it. It's like, man, I blew it. I, man, I screwed up. But God's mercies are new every morning. And you wake up and you say, today, I deny myself and I follow Jesus. I take up my cross today. And I will follow Jesus into this new day. So it's a daily dying. It's a daily taking up your cross. And that's Jesus saying, follow me. Follow me again today. Um, I used to be a part of this really, really cool convention by God's grace called Exponential. And I was the MC for it uh, for a few years, and I was in charge of all their main stage programming, our team at Momentum was. 
And it was really cool because it's a convention for pastors who start new, fresh churches and, and want to multiply them, you know, to, to show Jesus, to be Jesus to people, to lead people to Jesus, all that stuff. And so, man, I got to hear some really cool conversations from some of the greatest Christian leaders in the world. And sometimes some of that stuff hit the editing floor. Like, it didn't get on the stage. And I'd be like, how is that not get on the stage? It was so good. But you just have so much content from these amazing leaders. And you're like, I guess you just can't get everything on stage, you know? And so sometimes I'd be editing the, the stuff in a video for the main stage. You're like, how can this just can't go in there? We got to get this video down to six minutes. And that's it. I can't believe we're not going to keep that in there, but we can't. And one of the things was just a simple little story. We're on like a video call with a guy who's an amazing smiley leader named Andy Hawthorne. He's a Brit and he's a pastor in England. And he's a smiley British dude. And on a video call with just a few leaders from Exponential, he was telling stories. And I'm listening because I'm wanting to hear how his talk is going to end and what's going to go after his talk and the main stage programming. And he drops this quick little story about his great-grandfather, you know, these British family. And his, his great-grandfather's name was Captain Robert Hawthorne. And Captain Robert Hawthorne was one man in a group of the first Salvation Army missionaries who went, Brits, who went to India. Well, most of us who know history know about all that. We got chai tea from it and all that kind of stuff. But they go there, and he said that was the first group of Salvation Army missionaries. He goes, but this is what happened. And in his really cool accent that I won't do because it just sounds like bad Monty Python up here, he basically just said when that happened, they gave him like this, this pine crate and said, put all of your belongings. You each get one. You put all your belongings in this, and it'll ship over with you to India, and it's a one-way trip to India. And already I'm just like, man, I can't even get my mind around that. Like, we're going to India that's where, we're gonna, that's where I'm going to live the rest of my life. Here's my pine crate full of all my belongings. But the implication was, this is a one-way trip, and eventually when you get to India, one day, who knows how long, that will be your pine box. Like you are packing all of your belongings in what will one day be your coffin that you'll be buried in. And the implication was, and he told about his great-grandfather, just the pride of like, my great-grandfather, like, laid his life down to serve others in the name of Jesus. Like my great-grandfather did that. He was willing to die serving others in the name of Christ, telling people the good news about you don't understand how much God loves you. You just don't understand. Let me tell you about the good news of Jesus and how much God thinks of you. You know, the last few weeks have been amazing because in society and then even zooming in here as a microcosm at Momentum, um, for weeks we've been just kind of seeing this pre-pandemic level of activity kind of coming back. We're seeing light at the end of the tunnel, and it's pretty exciting. You know, at end of May, Biden says everyone will have had access to, you know, the vaccine and all that kind of stuff. And so there's been a lot of, like, pre-pandemic level of activity going on in Momentum's campus. You know, it's been really, really cool. Um, so we got some Mo Kids before and after. Like, downstairs, people have just been Tearing up MoKids, like when the pandemic started, we were doing it with that window in the back, trying to create a tech room and get the techs out of the room, and just, you know, the, the room was a mess, and we'll be able to create more seating in here, and so, you know, we tore open those, those poor cartoon kids. We just put holes right in them and tore it all open, and so, you know, it was the before and the during and the after, and so people have been preparing down there, doing construction, painting, cleaning, mounting TVs, which, by the way, if you're a handyman or a handywoman, we can always use your help at Momentum, dude. I mean, we need plumbing, we need electricians, we need HVAC dudes, we need IT people, we need all that kind of stuff. So anyways, we always got stuff like that going on, carpenters, we've always got stuff like that going on at the building in some way or another. Then we've had other people prepping bags for people that would come to our Easter extravaganza that happened yesterday. 141 kids got them and 260 people were served total. And so Mo Kids volunteers returning this morning wearing their lime green shirts and just this kind of pre-pandemic level of activity. Nothing will ever go back to normal as it was before, but there's some things, especially in the name of Jesus, that kind of have to get back to normal. We'll do some of them in different ways, but we got to serve people in the name of Jesus. We got to be good news to people. We got to show that to stuff. I mean, to people, we got we to gotta follow Jesus' footsteps and lay down our lives for others the way that Jesus laid down his life for people. And I think that this tension it's created is this. First off, you got some several people walking around this morning who are dog tired because we served at this event yesterday, and you know, once again, pink skin for 
you know, pasty white guys like me, and you just served at this event. But one of the things that happens is like people are walking around exhausted, but they're also walking around filled with joy because they're like, we got to serve people again. That was incredible, so cool. Like that's what we're called to do. And so one of the tensions that's created now, I think, is this. Naturally, this is not a guilt trip. Naturally, the pandemic has caused all of us to put up our guard, create some layers around ourselves, shield ourselves, stop touching people, stay away. Again, I get it. Some people are more compromised than me. I'm missing a spleen, so I'm immunocompromised. There are other people with worse conditions and all kinds of things going on. But we've had to create layers to protect ourselves from dirty, nasty, bacteria-filled, virus-filled people, right? And so now there's this tension of like, we've got into this place of like, okay, what is best for me? What is best for my family? In some cases, it's much simpler and it's not as noble. It's like, what's more convenient for me? What's more comfortable for me? And we've really become tempted to be very me-centered, and this is a temptation that if you follow Jesus and the old man is dead, that old person is gone, then you have to have the tension of what does it look like for me to put myself at risk in some way? Now, if you're immunocompromised, I get it. That's not what this is about. This is about spiritually speaking. What does it look like for me to again put myself at risk and love people and follow Jesus into the outcasts, into the community, touching and hugging dirty bacteria-covered virus-filled people occasionally when we don't know it? What does that ultimately look like to get back to that, to serve others like Jesus in our communities and in our church? What does that look like? And there is a tension there, and I don't have the answer for exactly you. Everyone's answer on how that needs to happen is different, but I, I guarantee the Holy Spirit, if he's alive and well in your life, is going to bug you and nag you about that stuff. Like, but I don't want to show up at a Mo group because of this. I don't want to show up at this. I don't know if I want my kids to be a part of it. I don't know. Like, eventually, it's going to have to come out if you're a mature follower of Jesus. Like, okay, that all is true. But the question is, if I don't show up to Mo group, who there am I not? Who am I not there for? Like, it isn't just for me. Who am I not showing up to serve, encourage, love, throw an arm around their neck and hug them, give them a noogie, whatever it is, just to be like, man, there are people there who are missing out on me being there, and I'm a mature follower of Jesus. And to say, man, I got to break out of that me shell and begin to, again, start pouring into people and laying down my life. And I'll make serving Jesus ultimately has to be, it's going to put me in my pine box. I'm going to do this until I die, until I'm cold and dead. And there's light at the end of the tunnel. And if you're a follower of Jesus daily, you have to say, what does that look like for me to say, today I'm following Jesus. Today I'm following Jesus. Today I'm surrendering to him. Today I'm submitting to him. Here's the deal. You were created for that. And so the more that you resist that, the more that you shield that, the more that you lean toward comfort or pleasure or whatever that is, the more you're going to be dissatisfied because it's built into you by, by our creator that he wants you to be like him, and he is a servant God. And he's built you. He's made you in his image. Imago Dei. He has made you in his image. And one of the things that's going to make you happy is to self-sacrifice. It's paradoxical. But the less you self-sacrifice, the less happy you're going to be. Like, it doesn't make any sense, but it's true. You have to give up your life to gain it, Jesus says. And so, if you are living more and more for comfort, aside from the pandemic, if you're living more and more for yourself, you're probably not very happy or you won't be very happy for long because you were designed for something more, to follow Jesus into service and into death. The art historians have speculated that maybe there was one intended patron that Montaigne actually painted this for, and maybe that patron, the reason that a patron, a buyer, would want a painting like this is maybe because they said, Montaigne, I would like for you to give me a painting because my devotional practice, my discipline, the way that I spend time with God, is I, I am focusing on the wounds of Christ. And it's something that I feel like I want to sit in front of and I want to wrestle with and I want to have to struggle with every day. I, I, want, I want to wrestle with that daily. And so some historians have speculated maybe the buyer, and who knows whatever happened that they didn't get it, but maybe they specifically asked for a painting that was this stark 
to make them wrestle with Jesus in the tomb. So I want to recommend this, that we, this week, if you're willing to take the challenge, make that kind of a devotional practice for ourselves leading up to Easter. And it could be on different levels. It could be for the next six to seven days that you daily, maybe in the morning if that's your time, say, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sit and I'm going to spend some time prayerfully meditating on the scriptures and on this, this painting and spend some time like Michael, uh, like, like, uh, Michael Frost did. I almost said Michael Scott. That ruins the sermon if it's from the office. Like, I just can't picture him taking this seriously. But, you know, if you're sitting there with it for six to seven days, or you can put it in your calendar and say, I'm going to do that on Good Friday and Saturday. I'm just going to sit there, and that's going to be part of my devotional time. So I'm going to work that in like what I usually do. I don't want to stop doing what I'm usually doing. I'm a creature of habit, so I'm just going to add this in and spend time with this painting. And I, because th this painting, for me, doesn't it just make you long for Easter to happen? Like, come on, show up. Like, come on, stone roll away. Like, come on, let's get to the happy ending. Let's get to the good part. But it's so important for us to just meditate on this. Having to look at this isn't any different than walking into the building and seeing a big cross on the wall. It represents death. That's what this is all about. So to sit with it, meditate, I think could really do something for us to make Easter even more meaningful. And so here's some ideas real quick on how you could do that. Take or leave any of these, but uh, reading John chapter 19 every day. You know, John chapter 19, which is stuff we've covered last week and this week. And, and just read it every day leading up to Easter Sunday. And then you could look at the image uh, of the painting on your phone, on a tablet, you know, on, on your television screen, in your living room. Turn on some classical music or some worship music. Just meditate on it. And maybe ask yourself, what's the first thing that catches my eye about this painting? And why? Why do I feel like my eyes are drawn to that? What is it? Why is that? And, and study that. Why were you drawn to it? Spend a few min minutes with the painting in silence. Just sit there and make yourself be quiet and, and, and stare at it for a little bit and just meditate on it. What, what does the painting teach you about God? When you look at this, you're going to wrestle with things about how could God show up and die, but you're also going to wrestle with how could God be a servant like I never expected? And you're going to wrestle with things about God. Or what does it say uh, about your current life situation? How does it speak to that for you? If you sit in silence with it, some stuff's going to come to your mind, hopefully from the Holy Spirit. Talk to God about what you're learning or need to learn from this painting. And then ultimately, maybe before you come to church next Sunday, you could begin by celebrating on Easter Sunday by reading John chapter 20 then on your own before you show up to church and, and be ready to celebrate, anticipating the resurrection. Uh, but man, funny enough, like thinking about looking at his feet in this painting, I think it's so funny that right before this scene of arrest and crucifixion and then tomb the last time he spent with his disciples john chapter 13 is him you know washing the feet of his disciples i think that's so interesting because he, he washes their feet he refuses to let them wash his he wants to wash their feet he wants to serve them he's a servant god and so then he says do for others and do for each other what i've done for you basically saying follow me like serve the way that i've served and then he goes and he dies and he's like lay your life down for others the way that i've laid my life down so but when you look at his feet it's really interesting because twice in this john chapter 13 thing happening he also says something different in john 13 he says this he's talking to his disciples and he says the same thing twice jesus says where i am going you cannot come well that's funny because he's always saying follow me follow me follow me where i'm going you cannot come then simon peter the spokesperson always speaks up asks them lord where are you going they just don't get it. And he's like, Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. So follow me, follow me, follow me. But where I'm going right now, you can't follow me. Like, what in the world does that mean? This is what it ultimately means. That we have every last one of us, no matter how pristine you think you are, we have all rebelled against God. Like we've all turned our back, we've all shaken our fist at God, we've all said, God, I know better, I'll do what I think's right. I'll piece it together and I'll make my decision. We've all rebelled against God, but Jesus didn't. He lived a perfect life. He showed up, lived a perfect life, which qualified him to be a perfect sacrifice on our behalf. And scripture says that on the cross, he became sin. You cannot follow me where I'm going. You can't do what I'm about to do. Because he was perfect, he became sin. And, and the cross, uh, like I've been reading a lot from this theologian named Jack Cottrell lately, 
And one of the concepts he's dropped here and there that just boggles my mind. I can't, my mind hurts thinking about it. But just try to take this in. He says that Jesus, because he's God in the flesh, because he's perfect and he's eternal and he's infinite, when he suffered and died on the cross for those six hours, that what he experienced on the cross, because he's perfect and eternal and infinite, what he experienced on the cross is the equivalent of an eternity in hell for us. I'm like, oh man, the math and the infinite and all that kind of stuff kind of boggles my mind, but he's saying because God's infinite, that pain and what he experienced for us as a substitution was infinite pain, infinite suffering that he experienced on the cross for us so that we wouldn't have to experience death and hell eternally like that, that he could be our substitution. So on the cross, Jesus became sin. He says, man, you can't follow me where I'm going. And so look at his feet. I mean, the, the prophet, 700 years before Jesus prophesied about someone coming who would be called the suffering servant, suffering servant. And one of the things he said was, by his wounds, we are healed. So this is the good news. Jesus' death means two things. One, it's an example. Follow me. Lay down your life. Take up your cross. Do it daily. Follow me and follow me into death. But the other thing that his death does, and really it's actually the more important of the two, is it's a substitution for us. That we can't live a perfect life. We've all blown it. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But by his wounds we are healed, and we can mourn, but we can also be thankful. And I love just the picture of as we're in the tomb of Jesus cramped in there with a mourning but thankful over Jesus, that if we are buried with Christ in the tomb with Jesus, when that stone rolls away, we get to exit the tomb with him. We get to run out of that tomb with him, raised to walk a new life. That's next week. That's Easter. Let's pray.